All right, so to finish up this Thursday show, I'll give a run back through my thoughts here on the two Thursday games. Then we'll take a look at the college football games we didn't get to on the show, including the ones we didn't get to on that segment there with Brad because we went off on a couple of different tangents, but I think it made for good fun radio anyway. Navy and Memphis, game 103-104. Again, I've got a video preview for this game over at Bang the Book dot, or over on our Bang the Book YouTube page. I like Memphis tonight. Again, this is the first time really since these two teams have started playing annually that Memphis is in a decent spot. Last year, game played in a monsoon. Memphis, despite running 30 fewer plays than Navy, still outgained Navy by about 65, 70 yards, whatever the actual number was. Two years ago, Memphis had some schedule changes because of a hurricane. Three years ago, Navy off of a double bye because they had a game canceled against East Carolina. So Memphis in a much better situational spot than they have been over the last the previous three meetings. Uh, again, Memphis, I think that as long as they get off the field in some capacity, Navy won't stop them. So Memphis should maximize just about all of its possessions. We'll see how many of those possessions they get. But I do like Memphis. They're laying 11 now. I got it at 10 and a half a little bit earlier in the week. A couple 10 and a half still hovering out there in the marketplace. But I do like Memphis in tonight's game. Uh, hopefully they've figured out how to defend the triple option with a little bit of extra prep time to get ready for it. Uh, and also, you know, can keep doing what they always do on the offensive side of the ledger. As far as the NFL game goes tonight, 101-102, Philadelphia and Green Bay. Green Bay, four-point favorite in this game. Total on this one now down to 46. I do like the under in this game. We talked about that earlier on in the week. You've got a Green Bay defense that's playing very, very well. I think a lot better than people anticipated. And this is something that happens in college football and the NFL. Mike Pettin, you know, was a head coach with the Cleveland Browns. Just not really cut out to be a head coach, but he's a very solid defensive mind. Some guys just aren't head coach material. Some guys are just coordinator material. I think Pettin is that guy for Green Bay. I think that this Green Bay defense is legit. They've got some playmakers. They've got a talented secondary. We'll see if Zadarius Smith winds up coming back and playing for this one. His status up in the air a little bit. But for Philadelphia, you know, look, they have gotten some good news about their skill position talent throughout the week. But still, you know, Green Bay is playing very, very good coverage in the secondary. Philadelphia's receivers aren't getting a lot of separation. And when they do, Carson Wentz is having trouble putting it on guys. He's having trouble throwing guys open. I think this is another spot where Philadelphia's offense does struggle a little bit. I think Green Bay's offense will continue to have its ups and downs as well. You've got a first-year head coach on Thursday Night Football trying to work in an offensive scheme that, you know, if you read between the lines with what Aaron Rodgers was saying early on in the year, a lot of language, a lot of verbiage with, a lot of verbiage with this offense. And when you get that, you get confusion. You get guys lining up in the wrong spots. You know, Green Bay had to focus on getting play calls in earlier, getting everybody set at the line of scrimmage earlier after that week one game against Chicago. And that doesn't even, you know, factor into the equation elements that Matt LaFleur wants to add to this playbook. So, again, these Thursday night games typically tend to be sloppy anyway. The defenses usually have the advantage because so many offenses in the NFL now are predicated on timing with the RPOs, a lot of quarterbacks with the autonomy to audible at the line of scrimmage. So a lot of these Thursday night games do wind up being pretty sloppy. I would expect that to be the case here in this game as well. So I do like the under 46 in this one. As far as the side goes, uh, again, we talked about this earlier on in the week where, you know, this line is a little bit inflated. It was Green Bay minus two over the summer. Look ahead line was, you know, probably in that two and a half, three range. Philadelphia loses to the Lions. Green Bay you know, manages to play okay against Denver, although a lot of people think the Broncos should have covered that game. Green Bay got points on two short fields, you know, so maybe this line is a little bit inflated. So maybe lean ever so slightly to the Philadelphia side. But like I said, uh, definitely looking at the under 46 in this one tonight, uh, down from 47 and a half as the opener. So not really losing a whole lot of value as of yet. But again, I think that this is one you probably want to get in on a little bit quicker. Uh, maybe the public buys this back up to 46 and a half or something like that. But you know, I, I would, I, I would be more inclined to see sharp money keep driving this total down a little bit here for this game. As far as the rest of the NFL card goes, we'll talk about it more on tomorrow's show with my super contest selection segment 
uh, for week four there in that contest over at the Westgate, also sharing my thoughts for the Circa Million. So as we switch back to the college football side here, spend the next 10 or 15 minutes or so hitting on some of these games that we didn't get to over the course of the week. One game on Friday that I can tell you I do like a fair amount, San Jose State and Air Force. I believe we mentioned this game in passing with Rolf Michaels on Tuesday. I think Air Force can name the score here. you got a San Jose State team coming off of that enormous win at Arkansas. Probably says more about Arkansas than it does about San Jose State. But now for the Spartans, short week, very quick turnaround to go take on an option team. And San Jose State has not played Air Force since 2016. Did play Army last year, so they did see an option. Army beat them 52-3, to had five and a half yards per carry in that game. So, I can say Jose State just undermanned against the option. Air Force, you know, they do have one of the Commander-in-Chief's trophy games on deck against Navy. But still, when you talk about the option, and we've mentioned this multiple times here on the show so far this season, the option takes time to come together. You've got to get that timing down. You've got to get the reads down. It's usually something that gets, you know, more and more efficient as the season goes along. Air Force did struggle last week against Boise State. Boise State very well prepared for the option, did what they needed to do on the offensive side. I don't think San Jose State can maximize its offensive possessions the same way, and I don't think Air Force struggles as much to move the football. So I think Air Force can name this score on Friday night. Uh, And also, too, look, for San Jose State, off Arkansas, big win, try to prep for the option, then go play in altitude in Colorado Springs on a short week, Air Force, it may be dicey in the first half, but Air Force should wear San Jose State down as this game goes along. So I like the minus 19, took it at a reduced juice price. Um, You can find an 18 or an 18 and a half out there. That's fantastic. But I do like Air Force in this game. Again, maybe a little bit of a squarer side, but I I don't think that San Jose State stops them. I think situationally, this is such a bad spot for the Spartans who are not a team accustomed to prosperity. They're not a team accustomed to winning. It's been a while since they've been, uh, you know, a 500-level team. So I think it's a tough spot for the Spartans here all the way around. As we move over to Saturday, some of the games that we didn't really talk about too much here on the show, uh, you've got Connecticut and Central Florida. UCF laying anywhere from 43 to 44 here against UConn. And I think this is a really interesting game because you've got a UCF team that has to be pissed off. You know, they get Stanford at home. They win that game in convincing fashion. They get another Power 5 team, this time on the road. They're trailing bad in the first half. They come back, take the lead, give up a fourth down touchdown, lose the game by a point. And this is one of those spots for a group of five team where you got to prove it. You know, when you want to talk national champion, you want to talk all the things that UCF talked, you know, really over the last, Uh, two and a half years, you got to back it up when you get your chances. And they did that against Stanford, and then they didn't against Pitt. You know, as in some places, you know, a 12 and a half, 13 point favorite on the road. Now they face UConn. And I think the expectation here is that UCF just does whatever they want to do in this game. They may go out there pissed off and hang 75 or 80 points. And it wouldn't surprise me if they do that. But also UCF does have Cincinnati on deck on a short week. And it may make you feel better for five or 10 minutes to beat UConn by 60. But I think they also want to hold some things back for Cincinnati. Maybe UCF in the first half where they are sufficiently motivated to go out there and really put a big number on UConn. Of course, we'll see what that first half line looks like. But maybe that's the angle here. But it's very tough to cover 44 when you've got much more important game on the horizon, and you just played two much more important emotional games. You know, this is the quintessential sandwich spot type of game for UCF because you know, you know, these kids aren't stupid. They know what UConn did last year. UConn gave up for the first three, four games of the year, UConn was giving up almost a first down per play. You know, you know, you can put up a number on UConn. So what is that focus level? What is your incentive? How engaged are you in this game? So for UCF, I don't know. I like to think in the first half they will be engaged. In the second half, you know, who really knows? You know, maybe Darrell Mack gets to play in this game. You know, maybe Brandon Wimbush comes in for Dylan Gabriel in this game. You know, we we don't really know. 
And I will say, if it is Mac or you know, Wimbush or something like that, UCF probably will run its offense. I don't think Josh Heupel will take the tempo off, especially if you take Dylan Gabriel out of the game. So there is that. There is the potential that UCF can run up a big number and probably will run up a big number. But again, I think maybe looking at the first half, if UCF is sufficiently ready to go, uh, maybe the thing that you want to look at there in that game. North Carolina State and Florida State, game 127-128 here. Florida State, six and a half, seven point favorite. I don't think Willie Taggart is, is, you know, the reason why this team is moving in the right direction here. You know, they very easily could have come back and upset Virginia. Uh, you know, they played well last week. Florida State, though, so much talent. And at some point, that talent has to rise. Whether it overcomes the coaching completely or not, that talent has to show itself. And for North Carolina State, they don't have as much talent. But they've got a very good head coach in Dave Doran who maximizes what he does have. What's the, you know, the deciding factor in this game? Is it Florida State's talent? Is it NC State's coaching advantage? I'm not sure. But I've not liked what I've seen the last couple of weeks from Matthew McKay, the NC State starter. Didn't play particularly well against West Virginia. Padded his numbers early on in the season as he was getting some experience. That's what concerns me here for NC State. Maybe the Kendall Bryles offense for Florida State is starting to take hold. You know, we'll see if it's Blackman or Hornerbrook that gets to start for Florida State. If it's Hornerbrook, he's very, very experienced. You know, and, and he's got skill guys that he can get the football to. So I do lean Florida State a little bit in this game. I don't love it by any means. I don't love laying numbers with coaches as bad as Willie Taggart. But again, you would think that the Kendall Bryles offense is taking hold. And also Florida State's just more athletic. They're just a more athletic team. And maybe perception of this program is starting to change a little bit. It's kind of gradual, but maybe it is starting to change a little bit. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't love it necessarily from a power rating standpoint. You know, I look at this game as Florida State minus four and a half. So kind of more in the range where it opened. But the market does like Florida State a little bit here. And I don't think it's a setup. I don't think it's to come back on NC State, who, you know, again, has struggled the last couple of weeks. I guess the true position where some people out there that are smarter than me think Florida State may be on an upward trajectory. That's why we're seeing the line move that we've seen here in this game. We move to game 139-140 here, Louisiana and Georgia Southern. And Louisiana is a team getting a lot of publicity, and probably deservedly so. They've outscored opponents by 102 points on the season here so far. They played right with Mississippi State in week one beat Liberty by three touchdowns, beat Texas Southern by a ton, then beat Ohio last week by 20 points on the road in Athens in kind of a tricky little spot. Now for Louisiana here, they run the football very, very well. So this is a game where we could have a very limited number of possessions. Not a surprise to see this total come down from 60 and a half to 55. Louisiana, great running team. One of the best running teams in the country, in fact, Two-headed monster with Trey Ragus and Elijah Mitchell. Then also their backup guys running for nine and a half, nine, ten yards per carry. So they run the football very, very effectively. Levi Lewis does what he needs to do as the quarterback, seven to two ratio, 65% completion percentage. The thing about this game is, how does Louisiana's defense do against that Georgia Southern option? And Georgia Southern, you know, look, I think that there, there's some misleading elements to what Georgia Southern has done so far this season. Yeah, they started with LSU, and they got blown out. They really struggled with Maine the following week, didn't have shy words to quarterback. Then it's Minnesota. You know, Minnesota very easily could have lost that game. Once again, shy words didn't play, but Georgia Southern had 198 yards in that game, 3.7 yards per carry. So Georgia Southern... There is the built-in excuse that Wirtz, you know, either hasn't played or hasn't been 100%. But I think there's some fool's goal with this team where people may think that they're a little bit better than they are. So I agree with this line move up from three with Juice to three and a half. I think it could continue to go up. Uh, And Louisiana Lafayette, you know, this was building. I mean, they're doing a very good job there uh, with Billy Napier, the head coach. He's gotten his first chance, former offensive coordinator. The offense is humming right along. You've got to like what you've seen from Louisiana here so far, and I agree with this line move going up. My line is more like Georgia Southern plus a half a point. 
So I've got to make some adjustments to Louisiana Lafayette here. Again, the limited number of possessions driving the total down. Lafayette should be efficient with them, or just Louisiana as they're called now, uh, should be efficient with them. Can Georgia Southern keep up from an efficiency standpoint? I don't think that's going to be the case. So I do lean Lafayette in there, Louisiana, in that game, uh, but not one that I've got one of my stronger opinions on of the week here. Look at Stanford and Oregon State. Mentioned I like Stanford earlier on in the week. I had a little bit of a difference of opinion with Rolf Michaels on that game. Again, Stanford playing, you know, a number two type schedule here in the country, top five type schedule so far this year. Northwestern, USC, UCF, Oregon. Now they're playing a team that's on their level or below their level. And yes, they're a road favorite here. I mean, Corvallis has not been a great place for Oregon State. One of the lower home field advantages in my calculations Look, Oregon State is improving, but I think Stanford still has the personnel to go and win a game like this. And if they don't, well, that's going to necessitate a power ratings adjustment for me. And look, I have Stanford in this game minus five and a half. So it's not like I'm that far off from where the market is. But if Stanford can't win a game like this, that says a lot about where this program is. It says a lot about the cluster injuries on the offensive line. And it may say some things about David Shaw, too. So this is a this is a must-win type of game, I think, for Stanford in my perception and also in theirs. Because if they want to make a bowl game here, these are the types of games you have to get. And if they don't get this one, it makes it very, very challenging to get to six victories. So I do like Stanford. I took Stanford minus three at extra juice. Now it's four, four and a half in the marketplace. I do agree with that move. Again, it is uh, in concert with my power ratings. But again, this is one of those spots where we're going to find out how bad Stanford is. I think if Stanford wins, it doesn't change a whole lot for me based on where I have them rated. If Stanford doesn't win, they're worse than we thought. And whether it's injuries or something else, it's just the reality for this season. Game 153-154, Indiana and Michigan State. Michigan State laying 14 here, down from 15 and a half. I think there's a little bit of inflation in this line. Michigan State is a team that a lot of people want to be good because a lot of people played season win total overs, maybe took a shot at some Big Ten futures with them. They were a team that had a rocket attached to them over the summer. A lot of power ratings came out and had Michigan State as a borderline top 10, you know, top 15 type of team. So far, they haven't really looked the part, but at the same time, they've given up 44 points in four games. So, defensively, they are legit. And for Indiana here, blown out by Ohio State in that Big Ten opener, they've played fairly well otherwise. They do have some injury concerns. Left tackle Coy Kronk now out for the season. That's a big deal against Michigan State, obviously. Some people think Michigan State has you know, a top three defensive line in the country. So there is that factor into the equation. But the thing about this game, and, and the thing about some of these games here this week, with some you know, uncharacteristically low totals in college football. How many points does the favorite need to cover or how many points does the underdog need to cover? And in this game, it's a question of how many points does Michigan state need to score to cover? Because I don't think Indiana has a lot of offensive success in this game. You know, they do have Kalen DeBoer. Maybe he's doing some things with the offense that are going to start to take hold, but Michigan state's defense is, is legit. I mean, the offense has its problems and we all know that. But the defense is quite legit, as we know. Total of 44 for this game with a 14-point Michigan State favorite. Again, implies that they're getting about a 28-14 type game. Does Indiana get over 14 points? If you think so, maybe you look at the Indiana side. If you think Michigan State can get into the high 20s, maybe you take the Michigan State side. Those are some of the questions that you get here in these games with big favorites and low totals. And this is one of them here where this line has gone down a little bit. Maybe the expectation that Indiana does a little bit better against Michigan State's defense than other teams have. Because keep in mind, you know, for Michigan State here on the season, yeah, they've given up 44 points in four games. Tulsa, not a great offense. Western Michigan, very inconsistent team. Arizona State, the 10 points they gave up there, well, Arizona State with a redshirt freshman quarterback going out on the road, long trip to East Lansing, and then Northwestern, whose offense is just abominable. I mean, they've been awful. Does Indiana have more success? 
Maybe the market seems to be looking that way. So maybe there's a context clue here with the total. If the expectation is for Indiana, who has an average-ish defense, the expectation is for Indiana to cover, maybe some points are scored in this game. Maybe you take the over on that low total. Again, context clues in the betting market, trying to figure out what these line moves mean, what they interpret from a game flow standpoint. To me, Indiana coming off of 15 and a half and going to 14 would suggest that somebody out there thinks their offense can have some success here against Michigan State. So again, maybe the over winds up coming into play there in East Lansing. Game 155-156, Clemson and North Carolina. Clemson 27 or so point favorite here. And what's really scary about the Clemson Tigers is they're still going out there and covering numbers or at the very least getting very close to doing so. They scored 24 points against A&M. They've scored 41 points in every other game. And Trevor Lawrence hasn't been great. Seven to five touchdown interception ratio, only two sacks. So they are keeping him clean, but not scrambling a whole lot. Only 11 carries, 62% completion rate. But those five touchdowns or those five interceptions, you know, Clemson's giving away some possessions here on the season, and they're still putting up exorbitant offensive numbers. So that's what concerns me here for North Carolina is if Clemson smooths out the rough edges with the turnovers and some of the other things that are going on, how terrifying are they at that point? North Carolina has looked good. You know, Sam Howell has been very good when he's got a clean pocket. He can really zip the football. Jay Bateman, the new defensive coordinator for North Carolina, should be a guy that improves this unit as the season goes along. And also for North Carolina, as we know, with Phil Longo, the offensive coordinator, he wants to push it. He wants to push that pace. Does he get the chance against Clemson? You know, does Clemson just not allow a whole lot of possessions? I don't know. I think the total looks a little light for this game at 60, simply because Clemson's got a lot of home run hitters. You know, Trevor Lawrence is throwing the picks, sure. But, you know, this is still a team here on the season that is creating a lot of explosive plays. You know, almost 14 yards per reception. They've got 1,000 receiving yards as a team already. They're running for six and a half yards per carry. So they can score in the blink of an eye. We know North Carolina is going to push the pace. Because, you know, if you're Phil Longo and you're Mac Brown and you're Jay Bateman, you don't think you have a chance to win this game anyway. So just do what you're trying to do with your offense. Install what you're trying to install with a lot of tempo. So even if they have some quick three and outs, Clemson may turn around and go 40 or 50 yards, you know, and score and give it right back to North Carolina again. So I think this could be a game where there are some points scored, you know, maybe a 49-21 type game, something like that. I think Clemson moves the football. I think North Carolina can move the football because of their tempo. Or at the very least, they're going to give it back to Clemson and Clemson's going to have the chance to run it up on them. So I think the over makes a little bit of sense there in Chapel Hill this weekend with game 155-156. As we bounce around the rest of the card here looking for some games, Texas Tech and Oklahoma. Oklahoma 27, 27 and a half point favorite. No Allen Bowman for Texas Tech. That hurts their ability to go score for score with Oklahoma. Uh, not going to lay the big number here by any means. Uh, but the Bowman injury is something you definitely want to factor into the equation uh, for Texas Tech. Not just in this game. But also as we go forward, uh, Coastal Carolina, 15 and a half point dog against Appalachian State. One of the biggest overlays in my power ratings this week is Appalachian State. I had them a 23 and a half point favorite in this game. So very, very big overlay here. The question, of course, how does Appalachian State fare coming off of that power five win last week against North Carolina? First power five win in 12 years since they beat Michigan up at the big house when they were an FCS team. Are they refocused? Are they you know, looking at this game in the correct context? Eli Drinkwitz said after that upset win over North Carolina, and I watched this postgame interview, you know, he said, look, we're going to enjoy this one for a day. Then it's all about conference play. Appalachian State has given up some points here, 82 points or 72 points, excuse me. In the last two games, Coastal scored 143. They've been able to move the football. Does Appalachian State button it up defensively? And also for Coastal Carolina, how good is this offense? You know, they scored 12 points at Kansas, then they hung 108 points on Norfolk State and UMass. I think I may wind up on Appalachian State here. I, again, it's a big power ratings overlay, 
So maybe I'm just trusting my numbers, but I think Coastal Carolina maybe a little bit overvalued out there in the market because of what they've done to a pretty poor FCS team and one of the worst FBS teams we've ever seen in college football. I think I may lay the number with Appalachian State here this weekend. Uh, Arkansas and Texas A&M, another game with a big line here. Texas A&M, 23, 23 and a half point favorite. Again, where is Arkansas's mindset? The really ugly loss last week to San Jose State. Nick Starkle provided a little bit of a boost for that Arkansas offense, and he got picked off five times last week. So where is he at? Where is this program at? This is a neutral site game in Arlington. It's not in College Station. It's in Arlington. Uh, Maybe that's the reason why this line opened a little bit light relative to what the market thinks. But again, you know, this is one of those situations here where it's, it's favored or nothing because Arkansas state could very well get absolutely embarrassed in this game because they're not just, they're just not very good. On the other hand for A&M, how do they bounce back off that Auburn performance? I guess we'll kind of wait and see. Finally, one more game to look at here to finish up the show game, 203, 204 UCLA and Arizona. Arizona six and a half point favorite here against UCLA. Couple different things. One, my line was minus eight. So this one opened about where I had it. So I'm happy with that because I didn't overreact to what UCLA did with that comeback win over Washington State. And also it seems like I have a very high variance team in Arizona power rated pretty accurately. Now the line is coming down. And I guess maybe there's some uh, you know, some argument out there that maybe the light came on for DTR last week and maybe the light came on for Chip Kelly and he found some plays that work and he found some things that work. That could very well be the case. I think this line moved down, though. It's more of an indictment of Arizona. Kevin's someone not doing a great job with that program. You know, it seems like maybe he's squandering Khalil Tate and J.J. Taylor, a very good running back. Marcel Yates, just I don't think he's the right guy for the defensive coordinator job. I think this line move here is more about Arizona than it is about UCLA. And the reason I say that is because irrespective of what happens in this game, when you make your power ratings adjustments for these two teams, keep that in mind relative to the closing number. I think this is more of a fade of Arizona as a favorite than it is buying into UCLA. So be very careful next week to not be too high on UCLA or if they have a buy in their following game, whatever the case may be. I would advise against being too high on UCLA. I think this is about Arizona. It's about not trusting Arizona, not believing in Kevin Sumlin and the coaching staff there uh, in Tucson. So that's my thought on that game. I could be wrong, but that's kind of the way that I'm interpreting this line move a little bit. Uh, So again, I would advise against being too high on UCLA if they do win and cover this game or, you know, something like that. And also, too, if they lose this game, again, there's not a lot of respect for Arizona in the marketplace and certainly not as a favorite. So I'd be very careful to overreact to what this game means if Arizona wins and covers or if UCLA covers or wins the game outright. I don't think this game tells us a whole lot really about either team other than to simply say that they're both high variance and that Arizona is a favorite is not a play that people are comfortable with making. Coming up on our Friday edition of Bang the Book Radio, Westgate Super Contest Selection Segment for Week 4 in the NFL. I'll give you my thoughts, my picks, my leans as we head on into the weekend. And then also Brent, the head risk manager down at DSI Sportsbook with this week's version of the Odds Report. Sharp money in both the college football and the NFL betting markets. We'll talk about that with him on tomorrow's show. I'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.